how do I unpin the zoom bar? I get to my tab for the book. This is table 2.4. Um, do, do you see the table? OK, great. So on table 3.4, we have the results of the multi-regression uh, model, multiple regression model, which has these coefficients. So the question is about the null hypothesis. Explain what conclusions you can draw based on these p-values. Your explanation should be based on these variables rather than the terms of the coefficients. So looking at this table, the hypothesis we have for each of these uh, coefficients, we are saying the null hypothesis to be uh, these co coefficients to be zero. And so we want to look at the significance of these coefficients. And when we look at the p-values other than newspaper, uh, TV and radio are significant. So in terms of those variables, uh, we can conclude that money spent on TV and radio are significantly associated with increased sales. Question number two is uh, the difference between KN and classifier and KN and regression methods. So classification, just to review, uh, predicts a class or a qualitative value, and regression is about predicting a number. So the KN and classifier works by voting the most frequent, frequent category, and then based on the frequent category, the predicted value would be that category. And the regression would be where an average of the response variable is uh, the predicted value. So it's the average of the nearest neighbors. So let's say if k equals to 5, we look at the values of 5 nearest neighbors, and then we take the average of those 5 values of the response. That would be the predicted value. At any point, if anyone wants to chime in, have any questions, please uh, stop me and let me know. Um, on the first question, I had a, a follow-up. So that's asking about the coefficients of the individual variables, right? That's not, it's not asking if any of the coefficients are not zero, right? Yeah. So that's why I was looking at the coefficients for four each variable and not the, I guess, the p-value of the F statistic? Yeah, that's my understanding also. OK. All right, so question number three, uh, suppose we have these predictors. x1 is GPA, x2 is IQ, x3 is a qualitative variable with value 1 equals to college and 0 for high school. X4 is the interaction between GPA and IQ, and X5 is another interaction with GPA and level. And the response is the starting salary after graduation. And after fitting the, uh, fitting the model to the data, we get these coefficient values. So uh, there are four choices, and they ask which answer is the correct one. So uh, in the answer here, they have plotted uh, the uh, GPA, IQ, and salary in this three-dimensional plot. And if we look at the relationship between GPA and salary, and we also look at the uh, variable uh, X3, 
which is level, because this is qualitative, we get two regression lines. So the blue one is college and the pink one is high school. And the choices we have, um, the first one says for a fixed value of IQ and GPA, high school graduates earn more on average than college graduates. So looking at the equation or, or the coefficients, we see that for the interaction term x4, GPA, and IQ, the coefficient is 0 0.01. And when we look at GPA and IQ individually, x1 and x2, then these are the coefficients. So for a moment, if we ignore this interaction term, then someone who has a college education definitely earns more than uh, someone with a high school education on average. But including the interaction term can change the result depending on what is the GPA. So below the value of about 3.5 of GPA, someone with a high school education would earn more compared to someone with a college education. But after that value, we see that the trend is the opposite. So this is because of the interaction between the GPA and IQ. So that makes the third choice here the correct one. For a fixed value of IQ and GPA, high school graduates earn more on average than college graduates, provided that the GPA is high enough. So in this case, when GPA is high enough, we see high school graduates earn more. Next is predict the salary of a college graduate with IQ of 110 and a, more, and a GPA of four. So um, in the solution here, they've created this function model where uh, given the coefficients and variables, uh, they calculate the value for the prediction. And if we provide GPA equals to four, IQ 110 and level equals one, then we get predicted salary of 137,000. Next, true or false, since the coefficient for the GPA or and IQ interaction term is very small, there is very little evidence of an interaction effect. Justify your answer. If we only look at the coefficient value, which is in this case uh, is 0 0.01, that in itself doesn't tell us anything about the effect uh, other than that it's positive because the scale can change depending on the units of the variables. So GPA and IQ have different scales and so that small value, absolute value, doesn't mean that uh, it's not important. Question number four. I collect a set of data with 100 observations and then fit a linear regression model uh, with cubic uh, as well as a separate cubic regression. So here's the equation for the cubic regression model. Part A says, suppose that a true relationship between X and Y is linear. Consider the training residual sum of squares for the linear regression. Also the training RSS for cubic regression. Would we expect one to be lower than the other would we expect them to be the same or is there not enough information to tell? So when we have data set and we, we know that the relationship is linear, then a cubic uh, regression model, when fit to the data, because it is very flexible, it can uh, overfit. And because of the overfitting, it can produce the lower residual sum of squares compared to a linear model. But if we look at the test set, which was not used while the model was fit on the data, for that, because we know that the relationship, actual relationship is linear, we do not expect the residual sum of squares to be lower. We think that 
for linear regression model, it would be lower than the cubic regression model for the test data, which was unknown to the model. Part C, suppose that the true relationship between X and Y is not linear, but we don't know how far it is from linear. Consider the training RSS for linear regression and also for cubic regression. Would we expect one to be lower than the other, same or not in enough information? So I initially thought that we may not have enough information, but I agree with this answer that you would expect the cubic regression to have lower residual sum of squares since it is at least as flexible as the linear regression. Anyone who disagrees with this answer? So this is talking about the training set, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that the answer makes sense in that training set context, yeah. Okay, part D, answer C using the test set. And so in that case, we don't have enough information and it depends on how nonlinear the relationship actually is. So without actually fitting the model, we can't say. Question five, consider the fitted values that result from performing linear regression without an intercept. In this setting, the ith fitted value takes the form of this, and then they ask, uh, depending on this equation, what is the value of a prime, uh, a i prime. So uh, this is the equation, which is also later asked about in a question uh, of an intercept, sorry, of the coefficient when in the model we don't have uh, an intercept coefficient. Uh, so I was thinking about this question. I was wondering where is it beneficial to use uh, a non-intercept term in the model? So without using the intercept, uh, does it make sense to create such a model? We can create it, but where would be the application of such a model? Yeah, I'm not sure because that, that implies that that the predicted value would be zero if the rest of the variables are zero or at their base level for factors, right? Yeah. Right, it, it kind of has an intercept, but it's zero. So there's no baseline effect or no baseline like status, I guess. Yeah, mathematically it makes sense, but for instance, for a case where we are predicting house price and the predictor is the size of the house. So if we say uh, the intercept is where X is zero, so if uh, the house size is zero, what would be the sale price of the house? So that doesn't make sense practically. Mathematically, yes, the intercept is zero, but uh, we cannot imagine a case where the house size is zero, but we still have a price. So I think in that case, uh, a model with zero intercept may make sense. What, what do you think? Yeah, I've not used one of those in practice. So it's hard to say. Yeah, to me, it makes sense that in that case, yes, intercept would be zero because we, if you don't have, if you have a house size of zero, then we don't have a sale price of that house. So yeah. It's but but the, ha the house size there is, the, is, a, is a, has its own coefficient, right? That's not the intercept. The intercept, I think, would be saying, like, if the intercept if you're trying to predict, if you're trying to predict house price, an intercept is a hundred thousand. Then that tells me that on average, the house the house price is a hundred thousand, plus or minus the other effects. But if so the if you intercept at zero intercept value, right? Well, but but, but no. In, in, the, in this case, if the intercept is zero. 
it means that the the the, the price is zero, and then you add effects. The price is zero uh, when the house size is zero in this example. Okay. Yeah, I understand mathematically the way you describe it makes sense to me. Uh, but yeah, I, I've never used such a model where the intercept is zero. So, but anyways, this is the derivation of the equation and they show that uh, what the value of AI prime is. Uh, one thing that um, I was not sure about was why they're using two different terms for the data points. I am assuming that i equals to one and i prime equals to one both refer to uh, the, a given row. Maybe it is mathematical notation that they choose to use different um, terms. Why not i equals to one in the denominator as well? No idea. I looked it up, but all I found was that sometimes mathemat mathematicians use uh, two different terms for the same thing, but I'm not sure if it is correct. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions about the derivation? Okay, let's move on to question number six. Using 3.4, argue that in the case of simple linear regression, the least squares line always passes through the point x bar and y bar, which are the means of x and y. So what they did here was they took the multiple regression equation and then plugged in x bar um, instead of xi here. And for a given x bar, uh, now if we uh, switch the value of, uh, or not switch, the plug in the value of beta naught, that would be y bar minus beta one times x bar. So when x is average, we expect the y to be average according to this equation. And so beta naught can be replaced with this part. And then that would lead to y bar. And so this is saying that the, the, that the lines will intersect, yeah. not that the lines are the same. Yeah. Okay. They would intersect. Um, question number seven. It is claimed in the text that in the case of simple linear regression of y onto x, the r squared statistic is equal to the square of the correlation between x and y. Prove that this is the case. So this is a detailed proof of um, how that is true. So for a simple regression model, we have the Pearson correlation r, and the square of that would be r squared. So based on the correlation equation, uh, they derived this and then showed that r squared is actually a square of r the Pearson correlation for simple regression model. Any questions about this? Okay, then the second section, applied questions. Question eight, this question involves the use of simple linear regression on the auto data set. Uh, so, I loaded this. I wanted to show a few other options we can use. Uh, I wasn't able to do it for all the questions, but for a few just to show uh, the other packages we may want to use. And if you look at the auto data set, we have mileage, and mileage is the uh, response in this example, and then we have other uh, predictor variables. So the first part was to fit the model, which they did here. My, mileage is the response with horsepower as predictor, and we get uh, this result. 
So looking at the model fit, we see the residual standard error, sorry, not the residual standard error, the R squared, which shows the overall goodness of fit of the model. We also look at the uh, significance of uh, intercept and horsepower coefficients and the F statistic that shows the overall significance. And we see that P value for that is also very small. So there does seem to be a relationship between predictor and the response. The strength of the relationship in this case can be uh, quantified using R squared. Next part is um, is the relationship between predictor and response positive or negative? So looking at the sign here, uh, it is negative. As we increase horsepower by one unit, the uh, mileage decreases by this much amount on average. Then what is a predicted value? Uh, so predicted value can be found by either using just this part so if we run the model fit and then find the prediction, so without providing any other option, we get the prediction right away. But this is also shown if we are estimating the confidence intervals or prediction intervals. So with interval equals to confidence, it gives us the 95% confidence interval of the predicted value. So this is the predicted value, the average value, and this is the lower and the upper confidence intervals. Similarly, if we ask for prediction intervals, this would now contain the irreducible error as well. And so the lower and upper confidence intervals, sorry, prediction intervals will be uh, larger uh, in absolute terms compared to uh, the confidence interval. Then plot the response and the predictor using the AB line function. So uh, in these solutions, they've used uh, base R plotting system. Uh, we know we can use uh, ggplot as well. If you want to use AB line, we can provide the fit results, or we can use GM smooths with method equals to LM that also produces the same result. Next, uh, use the plot function to produce diagnostic plots of the least squares regression fit. Uh, so plot is very useful here. Uh, we just need to provide uh, the, the fitted model and then it would show us these diagnostic plots. The other option we also discussed the last time was the performance package. So with check model, we can we get similar plots. For some reason, it doesn't render the first time. OK, anyways, we can just focus here. So uh, the first plot here is the residual plot where we have the fitted values from the model on x-axis and the errors on y-axis. And if you look at the pattern here, it seems to be a nonlinear relationship, which means that uh, this is probably violating the assumptions of the linear regression model. Uh, the second one is quantile model. Uh, quantile residuals. Uh, so we have theoretical quantiles on x-axis and standardized residuals on y-axis. Uh, if the model uh, or the relationship is linear, then these points should be perfectly aligned on uh, this dashed line. So if it is very far from the dashed line, then it indicates that it's violating the assumptions of the regression model. Uh, another plot we see is the uh, is between fitted values and the standardized residuals. Uh, so this helps us locating the uh, outliers. So we see uh, the point number three thirty four. That's an outlier, and so on. And the fourth plot here is about leverage. 
So leverage is about how different uh, a given data point is compared to the rest of the uh, predictor. So in a given predictor, we are comparing how different the point is from the other values. So in this case, it identifies the observation 117 and others to be le uh, to have high leverage. If we want to include these uh, as they are included in this uh, model, then we get different results. If we exclude them, then we may get slightly better results in terms of uh, model fit. Question number nine. This question involves the use of multiple regression on the auto data set. The first is to produce the scatter plot matrix. So uh, we learned about uh, the pairs function, uh, GG pairs function from Gali uh, package, I think uh, in a previous session. Uh, that was one option. Another is to use the pairs function and that would uh, plot the pairwise uh, scatter plot. Next is compute the matrix of correlations. We can do that by using core. Uh, they remove the name because name has uh, a lot of uh, unique values. Next, uh, use the ln function to perform a multiple regression model with MPG as a response and all other variables except name as the predictors. Use the summary function to print the results. Is there a relationship between the predictors and the response? So the syntax for uh, providing all predictors is a period and MPG is our response. Looking at the model fit, we see that multiple R squared is 0.82. And when we look at the uh, significance of these variables, we see cylinders and horsepower and acceleration. They do not seem to be significantly associated with mileage at 95% confidence level. So yes, there is a relationship, but these variables uh, are not significant. Others are. The coefficient for year, which is positive 0.75, suggests that mileage increases by about this amount every year on average. Then these are again the diagnostic plots. Do the residual plot suggest any unusually large outliers? Looking at this, yes, there are some large outliers. And uh, if you look at the points that have high leverage, we do identify a few in these plots as well. Next is to include interaction effects. So the syntax for that is to use uh, colon, or we can also use star. So here we are including all the variables as before but we are adding an interaction effect between weight and horsepower. And then based on that, we get a different model. And if we focus on this interaction effect, we see that it is, it is indeed significant. Uh, we have very small value of P, P value, and uh, we have multiple R squared of 0.868. Another example they did was between acceleration and horsepower, and then cylinders and weight. In all cases, we see that there are significant uh, effect of these uh, interaction effects, or their coefficients are significant. Try a few different transformations of the variables, such as log of the predictor and others. So in this uh, example, they showed in the plot uh, what that looks like. So this is the original horsepower variable on x-axis and mileage on y-axis. If we take the log of horsepower, then 
the relationship seems to be more linear compared to the original. And similarly with square root, it also seems to be uh, more linear compared to the original. With horsepower squared, it does seem to be quadratic because we squared the term. And if you transform the, the target variable, then you've got to untransform it once you make the prediction, right? Yeah, if we transform it, then yeah, before making a prediction, like we said, we need to, if you're, for example, taking log, then you need to do exponent to the power of the predicted value, and then that would give us the final prediction. And this is another example. Um, actually, based on the trans transformed horsepower, uh, log transformed, they fit the model again. And uh, if we compare, for example, here we get 0.837. And here we got 0.85. So results are similar in terms of the model goodness of fit. And if you look at the uh, significant variables, then cylinders is not significant compared to this where cylinders does seem to be significant. This is with the original model or originally I used horsepower and this is with the log transform horsepower. So we don't see very different results. They're similar. But when we look at the diagnostic plots, then we see a difference. Now the residual plots seem to be uh, meeting the assumptions of the regression, linear regression model. So there is a relationship, uh, but it's not as uh, as clear or strong as we see here. It's almost more heteroscedastic on the second one. Uh, here, based on this yeah. plot? Uh, no, uh, uh, in the, the first yeah. of those four plots. On the Residuals versus fitted. I was talking about. I think uh, that's this plot, right? So, with this plot, oh, okay. yeah, it's. Uh, I think there is another example uh, where we see that difference. In this one, uh, it, it does seem that the variance is constant throughout mm -hmm. uh, the fitted values, and it seems similar in case of the transformed horsepower variable. Oh, okay, I, I think I was looking at the... Yeah, I think there is another example later. Yeah. Um, um, just to, before we move on there on the transformed variables, that also changes the unit of the coefficient, right? Yeah. Like if you take the log of horsepower, it's no longer, this is the change you expect if you increase horsepower by one unit. It's yeah, now the point. increase, if you increase the log of horsepower by one, right? Yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. Interpretation changes, yeah. And I think if you go to the go to the table that has the coefficients, the coefficient for the, for the horsepower there is like nine. Yeah. Which is much larger than everything else. Yeah, the actual coefficient with, with the uh, original horsepower is like this. If you if you log transform it, is that is the coefficient? I forget. Is that you can consider that you can, you can consider it a percent change. I think I read that somewhere, but I'm not sure. With log transformation. Yeah, if you log transform the 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 predictor. I I'm not sure. If you find that again, please share. Yeah. Okay, so next is question number 10. 
This question should be answered using the car seats data set. So car seats data set has these um, three variables that were asked in the question to be fitted. If you look at car seats, so sales uh, is our uh, response. And then there is price, price, company charges for car seats. Urban is a factor with two levels, no and yes. So yes means that it is in an urban store. No means rural store. And US indicates whether the store was in US or not. So based on that, this is the result. We look at the p-value for the significance of the coefficients and we see that uh, urban yes does not seem to be significant um, and US yes is significant. So one difference between this example and the previous ones we saw is that we are now using two qualitative variables urban and US and one quantitative variable which is price. So because it is qualitative there is a base level in this case the base level is urban no and us no and so the equation would look like this we have 13 as the intercept right here then we have negative 0.054 into price based on this coefficient then if urban variable is yes and us variable is no then we get this coefficient negative 0.022 and if it is no the urban variable and us is yes then this is the coefficient that we add to the equation but if urban and us both are yes then we essentially have plus 1.2 minus 0 0.022 that gives us 1.18 if they're both zero then we, we are left with this equation. Next, for which of the predictors can you reject the null hypothesis uh, that a given coefficient is equal to zero? Price and US, uh, here we can reject the null hypothesis, but for the urban variable or uh, predictor, uh, we fail to reject the hypothesis because the p-value is higher than 0.05. That's the criteria for the 95% significance level. On the basis of your response to the previous question, fit a smaller model for which there is evidence of association with the outcome. So now they have removed the variable which was not significant and get this result and uh, sorry get this result so in this case uh, we see that models are again not very different uh, the r squared here and here is similar f statistic uh, does seem to increase uh, but i think absolute terms here uh, doesn't don't matter much the significance uh, value uh, is more important so the models don't seem to be very different but we know that urban variable is not significant. Um, one way to check that is by comparing the two fits by running ANOVA. And so here uh, they show the residual uh, degrees of freedom, uh, the residual sum of squares, which we see are clearly not different. Um, and then the p-value for the statistic. So here I think the statistic checks for the difference between the two models and we see uh, that it is higher than 0.05 which means that the models are not different or the other way to interpret that is to say that they have similar r squared and the model containing the extra variable urban is not significantly better next uh, part here is to obtain 95 percent confidence intervals for the coefficients Previously, we've seen the uh, confidence intervals for the predicted value. For that, we use a predict function. 
but to get the coefficients for sorry the confidence intervals for coefficients we use the con int function and so for the first uh, coefficient which is intercept uh, we get the two intervals based on 95 percent confidence interval similarly we get for price as well as for the u.s uh, predictors is there evidence of outliers or high leverage observations uh, for some outliers yes so these are indicated here and uh, there are some points which have high leverage as well which are also shown on this plot question 11 in this problem we will investigate the t statistic for the null hypothesis beta equals to zero in simple linear regression without an intercept to begin we generate a predictor x and y response as follows so we we have a population regression line here already uh, y is based on x so this is uh, uh, the fake data that is created first and then the ask to fit the model on this generated data but without an intercept term in the equation so the syntax for that is to add a zero in the lm function input that would fit a model without an intercept or an intercept of zero and based on that we get these uh, th this coefficient because there's a single predictor so we get 1.99 which is pretty close to 2 which means that we get a similar relationship so there's a significant positive relationship between y and x as you can see based on this probability the p-value next perform a simple linear regression of x onto y so this is opposite so before we use y as response now we're using x as response and now we get 0.39 which is close to 0.5 which we expect the relationship between them to be because our original uh, equations are these so y is or x is half of y in terms of the coefficient so that's why we get a value of about 0.4 which is close to 0.5 and is also significant what is the relationship between the results obtained in A and B? So without error, the coefficients would be inverse of each other, which we do see in the results. And the t-statistic and p-values are the same between them. So here's the t-statistic for y onto x regression and here x onto y regression. We don't see any difference between the t-value. For the regression of y onto x without an intercept, the t statistic for this null hypothesis takes the form of this formula where beta hat is given by 3.38 defined above. So based on this standard error, show algebraically and confirm numerically in R that the t statistic can be written as this formula. So uh, I think I'm going to skip uh, this part uh, and look at the numerical part. So with, uh, within R, they plugged in this formula and uh, found that the T value is the same as uh, printed out by the LM model, the summary function. Using the results from RD, argue that the T statistic for the regression of Y onto X is the same as T statistics for the regression of X onto Y. So even if we change or swap the xi to yi will get the same value of t and we can confirm that if we run this again we swap x and y in r show that when regression is performed with an intercept the t statistic for uh, beta 1 equals to 0 null hypothesis is the same for the regression of y onto x so in this first run they fit the model with y onto x and found the coefficient and then did the same with x onto y 
we see the uh, different value of uh, the coefficient for x and the coefficient for y, which we expected as before. The x should be the coefficient should be two here and about 0.5 here, uh, but the t value doesn't change. T value is the same. The significance doesn't change, even if we swap the values. But practically, I think, uh, I don't think of any reason why this is important to know. Practically, we do know what our response is. All right, question number 12. Uh, this problem involves simple linear regression without an intercept. We call that the coefficient estimate beta x for the linear regression of y onto x without an intercept is given by this equation. Under what circumstance is the coefficient estimate for regression of x onto y the same as coefficient estimate? Uh, so I think this is also similar to what uh, was discussed in the previous example. But they show uh, this formula again for beta hat when we swap the regression. Uh, models and here they show uh, what the coefficients would look like. This is based on again these equations and then the coefficients are similar to as we saw before. So I'm going to skip the remaining of this if, uh, if it's okay. Question number 13 in this exercise, you will create some simulated data and will fit simple linear, linear regression models to it. Make sure to use set.seed prior to our starting part A. So in part A, uh, we first generate uh, X based on randomly um, picked values from normal distribution. Here, mean is zero and standard deviation is one. The second one, mean is zero, variance is 0.25. So we do a square root to find the standard deviation. And then this is the relationship that they give us uh, as a population regression line. So we have y equals to this uh, equation. And then because we generated the data by ourselves, we are now fitting the model to this data. And uh, we then look at the coefficient values. We also look at uh, the relationship in terms of uh, the scatter plot. And after fitting the model, we get this result. So we know from this equation that the intercept should be negative 1 and the beta 1 coefficient should be 0 0.5. Now, looking at the result, we see indeed the intercept is about negative 1 and the beta 1 coefficient is 0.5. Then here is the result of the least uh, squares line, model fit and the population line. We can see that they are quite similar. Then they ask for fitting a polynomial regression model. So the uh, syntax for that is to use the function poly so y is a function of poly, and then we provide x, and then we provide uh, the term for the poly polynomial. In this case, it's 2 because it's quadratic. And then we compare the previous fit we had uh, with the new fit of the quadratic regression model. And we see uh, the sum of squares is not very different. Uh, but when we look at the a p-value of f statistic, it is higher than 0.05. So there is no evidence for an improved fit. The linear model, as we know from the original data generation process, is the actual relationship. Now, the next part was to repeat this uh, with less noise. So instead of using a uh, variance of 0.25, they use 0.05 and then got these results. Again, we see the model results are very similar. And then with more noise. So now uh, they uh, used higher noise value 
for the model. And we see this is all where we clearly see different uh, fit compared to the population regression line. So this is uh, with less noise. Uh, we look at the confidence interval. So if we focus on the confidence interval of the uh, beta 1 coefficient, we see it's between 0.39 and 0.6. But with more noise, we see it's uh, actually, this is the original one. This is with less noise, and this is with more noise. So the FIT3 shows 0.26 to 0.59. And FIT2 shows 0.48 to 0.56. So this interval has a narrower range compared to uh, the FIT with higher noise. OK, question number 14. Uh, this is about collinearity. So here, the equation for the model is of this form. We have two. Uh, axis, and this is a data generation process that's used to generate a y based on x1 and x2. So again, we know what is the population regression line, but since this is about collinearity, we are looking about looking at the correlation between x1 and x2. They are clearly correlated because, as we see here, x2 is based on x1. Because of this collinearity, when we fit the model, the result we see is that x2 has uh, is not significant, the coefficient for that. And then we fit the model again, but this time only use x1. So we remove x2. And we see x1 is significant, which it was before, but this time the significance uh, is higher because the p-value is smaller. And we also fit the model with x2. Since x1 and x2 are correlated, we expect that x2 is a proxy of x1. And uh, we get, again, a significant coefficient for x2 as well. In the original model, that was not the case. So this means that if we have collinearity problem, it's better to drop one of the two uh, predictors. So do the results obtained uh, contradict each other? They don't because we have collinearity problem. Separating, fitting them, we, we can see that. Um, refit the linear models from C to E using this new data set. So there's one additional point, but this is mismeasured, which means that this is an outlier. And we fit the model all three models again, and we look at the diagnostic plots. So here in, in the residuals, we can see, uh, sorry, in the leverage plot, we can see that uh, there's a high leverage of this new newly added point. And that's then uh, clearly seen in the other model fits as well, that we have uh, these uh, high leverage points in the data. This is with X2 which had that high leverage uh, point added. So we can see that here. So here we have a high value. But we can clearly see that when we plot x1 and x2 with this newly added point, x2 has this point uh, beyond the usual range of x2. So the usual range is starting here up to about 0.6. But this new point was about 0.8, and that's why we see uh, that X2 uh, has a high leverage. Uh, sorry, this point has a high leverage when you fit the model. Question 15 is about the Boston data set. Um, predict a per capita crime rate using the other variables in the data set. In other words, per capita crime rate is the response and the other variables are the predictors. So uh, we fit the model separately for each of the predictors. So this uh, is essentially uh, fitting the model for each 
uh, x separately and then using do dot call uh, we then print the coefficient matrix and we see this result and here we see with separate fits uh, the chas uh, variable is not significant if you look at the boston data set it is a dummy variable for charles river so it's one if uh, it's within the uh, census tract uh, otherwise it's zero so this variable is, is not significant. All other variables seem to be significant when simple regression models are fit. Then next, fit a multiple regression model and we, we check null hypothesis that all the coefficient values are zero. So now we use our usual syntax of fitting a multiple regression model. And now we see that only a few variables ZN, DIS, RAD, and um, I know about this one, this is median income, others I tend to forget. Uh, these are the significant variables in the model. Then how do your results from the individual fits of the variables uh, or predictors compared with uh, the multiple regression model? Create a plot displaying the univariate regression coefficients from uh, A on the x-axis and the multiple regression coefficient from B on the y-axis. So uh, the code for that is, again, using the plot function, but they provide the coefficients for, from the two models by using this index, and we get this plot. So other than this, point, which is for the Knox predictor, we see that univariate regression and multiple regression both lead to almost similar uh, values of the coefficients. So they are different, but not very much. But this Knox variable definitely has a different coefficient with univariate regression compared to multiple regression model. Then they further ask for fitting this model the quadratic uh, actually polynomial uh, model, uh, which is then fitted here. And we look at the results uh, of each uh, model. So we see this is for the ZN, then Indus, and then so on. So for each predictor, we have a separate polynomial equation that is fitted. And based on these results, we can see which one doesn't have significance at all and where the significance is high. So for instance, let me choose uh, one or two cases. So here, the third term, a polynomial term for the ZN variable is not significant. And then similarly, uh, the third one for RM variable is also not significant. So the conclusion here is that there is strong evidence for many variables having nonlinear associations. In many cases, the addition of a cubic term is significant. In other cases, although the cubic term is not significant, the square term is significant. Any questions, any other points? Sorry for a very long session. I'm gonna stop uh, sharing my screen. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, it was a really interesting uh, <laughs> chapter because you took time to go through the entire exercise. Uh, let me put stop in the chat.